He puts his phone down on the kitchen counter, voice note forgotten, waits, and watches dumbly as the door swings forward as the figure steps into the room. What are you doing here? He asks. Calm, reasonable, nothing to hide, not afraid, or not yet. And why? Then he sees what his intruder holds. Now, now the fear comes. Three hours later, Jess. For Christ's sake, Ben, answer your phone. I'm freezing my tits off out here. My Eurostar was two hours late leaving London. I should have arrived at 10.30, but it's just gone midnight. And it's cold tonight. Even colder here in Paris than it was in London. It's only the end of October, but my breath smokes in the air and my toes are numb in my boots. Crazy to think there was a heat wave only a few weeks ago. I need a proper coat, but there's always been a lot of things I need that I'm never going to get. I've probably called Ben ten times now, as my Eurostar pulled in, on the half-hour walk here from Gare du Nord. No answer, and he hasn't replied to any of my texts. Thanks for nothing, big bro. He said he'd be here to let me in. Just ring the buzzer. I'll be up waiting for you. Well, I'm here. Here being a dimly lit, cobblestoned cul-de-sac in what appears to be a seriously posh neighbourhood. The apartment building in front of me closes off this end, standing all on its own. I glance back down the empty street. Beside a parked car about twenty feet away, I think I see the shadows shift. I step to the side, to try and get a better look. There's a squint, trying to make out the shape. I could swear there's someone there, crouched behind the car. I jump, as a siren blares a few streets away, loud in the silence. Listen as the sound fades away into the night. It's different to the ones at home. Nee nor, nee nor, like a child's impression, but it still makes my heart beat a little faster. I glance back at the shadowy area behind the parked car. Now I can't make out any movement, can't even see the shape I thought I glimpsed before. Maybe it was just a trick of the light, after all. I look back up at the building. The others on this street are beautiful but this one knocks spots off them all. It's set back from the road behind a big gate with a high wall on either side, concealing what must be some sort of garden or courtyard. Five or six stories, huge windows, all with wrought iron balconies. A big sprawl of ivy growing all over the front of it, which looks like a creeping dark stain. If I crane my neck, I can see what might be a roof garden on the top, the spiky shapes of the trees and shrubs' black cutouts against the night sky. I double-check the address. Number 12, Rue des Armands. I've definitely got it right. I still can't quite believe this swanky apartment building is where Ben's been living. He said a mate helped sort him out with it, someone he knew from his student days but then Ben's always managed to fall on his feet. I suppose it only makes sense that he's charmed his way into a place like this. And charm must have done it. I know journalists probably earn more than bartenders, but not by this much. The metal gate in front of me has a brass lion's head knocker, the fat metal ring held between snarling teeth. Along the top of the gate, I notice, is a bristle of anti-climb spikes, and all along the high wall either side of the gate are embedded shards of glass. These security measures feel kind of at odds with the elegance of the building. I lift up the knocker, cold and heavy in my hand, let it drop. The clang of it bounces off the cobblestones, so much louder than expected in the silence. In fact, 
He puts his phone down on the kitchen.